Let's face it. Our cars are by far the most complicated thing we own. That sweet ride rolling off the line tomorrow is going to have at least 100 million lines of code, some triple digit number of sensors, which is growing by the day, it seems, and a whole lot of systems to keep you safe, secure, and happy trucking down the road. There's a key word there that is more important than all the rest. Safe. In the realm of automotive designs, safety must reign above all else. But as designers, how do we innovate within the constraints of today's safety standards? Carefully, that's how. Hi, I'm Amelia Dalton, host of Chalk Talk. In today's Chalk Talk, we will investigate the language of risk, fault determination, and the role of open source software in today's automotive designs. Rob Bates from Siemens joins me to discuss the role ISO 26262 plays when it comes to COTS and open source software, what certified software components are all about, and how heterogeneous multiprocessing can be helpful in your next automotive design. And before we get started, don't forget to click that link. There you can find even more information about this topic from Siemens. Hi, Rob. Thank you so much for joining me. Hey, Amelia. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you for asking. Okay, so we're talking about software and automotive safety today. But Rob, before we get started, what is the biggest challenge as you see it that we're trying to solve here? Well, the challenges are several. You know, if I am an automotive supplier or more likely a a tier one supplier to the automaker, I have to be totally focused on a, on a number of things, right? I have to be considering a, the functionality of the things that I'm making. And then I have to also make sure that they are safe, that if they misbehave in some way, that it's controlled and will not cause harm to the driver or to the people around them. And as we are moving forward in time, those systems are becoming more and more complicated. And as they become more complicated, It's in everyone's best interest to use best-in-class providers for components of those devices so that they are as robust, feature-rich, and safe as possible. And so the challenge that we see, that I see the most, is around how do you use that third-party software, whether it comes from a supplier or if it comes from the open source, in my device and still maintain those fundamental safety requirements that the, uh, the end device will actually require. That makes sense. Now, Rob, can we back up a little bit? What kind of faults are we really looking to address here? So there are a lot of different kinds of faults, but they fall into two basic buckets. We call them systemic faults and random faults. A systemic fault is basically something that's kind of like a bug. You know, you write a piece of software or you have a hardware device and something happens in the outside world to that, the software or the hardware or whatever, and it doesn't behave in a way that you expect. And so in systemic faults, they are, at least in theory, completely preventable. And you prevent them by essentially applying process measures. You know, do you do sufficient testing? Do you test all of those kind of edge cases and other things that can go wrong to verify that the hardware and software will behave as you expect? Now, that's sometimes really hard, right? I mean, sometimes you can't even envision what the triggering aspect for an issue might be. And so what we try to do is we try to handle those systemic faults in a way that does not impact the functional safety. And then beyond systemic faults, there are random faults. Now, random faults are things that you can't really control. A photon comes in and it blows away a piece of your RAM, or your silicon ages and it stops working. Anybody who's had an old PC knows that at some point, things just happen as the silicon and other hardware ages that cause it to fail in a way that it didn't used to fail. Well, cars are basically a collection of microcontrollers and computers, and the exact same things can happen. So these are the kinds of things that are inherent in any kind of system that's expected to be used under difficult conditions for a long period of time. And it's not new. 
you know, we talk about microcontrollers and all of those things, but as everyone knows, you know, mechanical systems used to fail. You know, if you're an old person like me and you had a car with a carburetor, you know, it would occasionally go bad and you'd have to replace it. That's the exact same thing, except that the microcontrollers are a little bit harder to replace. So the point here is that you can't really prevent these things from happening. They're going to happen as systems age, but you can predict the way that those things are going to fail, right? You can predict that this controller might have this kind of event with this percentage of likelihood over this period of time. And if you can predict it, then you can at least try to detect it and transition to some kind of state where that failure doesn't cause a safety problem. And that's kind of the whole point is to identify the faults that can happen and then to do something about them. So Rob, how does the standard ISO 26262 play into the solution for these faults? So 26262 or 26262 is the main standard that we talk about when we talk about automotive functional safety. There are other safety standards that are used in other industries, but they're all trying to accomplish the same thing. They're trying to understand the faults what can go wrong. And then once you've identified those faults, then you talk about, well, what kind of requirements, what kinds of mitigations are going to be necessary so that if and when those faults occur, we don't have a real problem, or if we have a real problem that we can do something about it. And then from there, you create requirements to make sure that those mitigations actually occur Those are called safety requirements. And then you make sure that those safety requirements are carried forward through your entire design and development process. So what 26262 is doing is it's basically focusing on the system. It's not focusing on any one part of the system, even though the system isn't necessarily the whole automobile. It may be an engine controller or a braking controller or whatever. And it attempts to achieve functional safety by basically defining the complete safety life cycle from the identification of the faults to the verification of the entire device and every step in between. And then it says, well, okay, so we've defined this life cycle. We don't really expect you to do every single little thing that we're asking for, but we expect you to do most of it. And we expect you to justify any changes that you make. That's called tailoring. So you can tailor your conformance to the way that you actually work. And then the kind of the most important thing that it does is it gives us a language to describe the risks that might occur. Because, for example, if you have a rear backup camera, and we all kind of depend upon our rear backup cameras now to do almost anything, if your rear backup camera fails then you have lots of other things that you can do. You know, you can go back to old fashioned and actually use your mirrors to do what the rear backup camera is helping you to do. And so a failure there, it's a safety problem, but it's not nearly as bad as if you're running autonomous drive and your autonomous drive fails. And so it gives us a way of saying, hey, these safety issues are of different levels. And the ACILs, the automotive safety integrity levels, change based on how severe that is. And then all of that tailored safety life cycle we talked about a couple of minutes ago basically can be mapped to say, hey, if I've got a real serious problem, if a fault occurs and is not mitigated, then that has a high ACIL level referred to as ACIL D. They're all letters for some reason. If I've got a minor problem and it fails, then it becomes ACIL A and it's less stringent in what it asks us for. And then once again, this covers the entire life cycle. It covers everything from the way that you specify things to the way that you test them, to the way that you interact with your suppliers, to the way that you retire systems when they've exceeded their useful life. So today we're going to talk about software because you know we could talk for several weeks on every aspect of what automotive functional safety is. But just keep in mind that 26262 is going to talk about the whole life cycle, and we're going to touch on parts of that as they apply to where the software runs, i.e. the microprocessors. So, Rob, I would imagine that there are also a slew of software requirements here as well, right? What kind of requirements are determined by this standard? 
we went back and we talked about the faults and then the mitigations to those faults and the requirements that come from those mitigations. And as far as functional safety is concerned, those are the only requirements that we care about. If we have other systems in the automobile that don't really impact functional safety, say like, oh, I don't know, the radio, the requirements for that are all functional requirements, right? How should your infotainment system work? And ISO 26262 doesn't really say anything about that. Another big example is security. You know, as we all know, cars are becoming more and more connected to the world. When you introduce a microprocessor to the world, you introduce the likelihood that someone's going to try to figure out how to exploit that microprocessor for whatever means that they might want to, whether they want to blackmail you or the automotive company, whether they want to do Bitcoin mining, whether they want to do anything. And so there's, you know, hand in hand with a safety life cycle, more and more in automotive, we're concerned about a security life cycle. Uh, ISO 262 doesn't really have anything to say about the security life cycle. So those kinds of requirements are kind of outside the scope of ISO 262. However, many organizations, uh, most organizations, have come to a decision that just because 262 only applies to the safety requirements, it becomes difficult to manage different kinds of requirements being managed different kinds of ways with different life cycles. And there's nothing in 262262, especially as far as software is concerned, that is nothing more than good developmental practice. And so in many cases, we basically just say, you know, we don't really care what the requirement is. We're going to develop it in a way that is consistent with what 262262 is telling us, and then we don't have to worry about it later. That becomes especially true as we move into talking about what third-party software has to do with the standard. Okay, so Rob, a lot of automotive designs, like you said, rely on third-party software. So how exactly does that come into play here? So ISO 26262 really doesn't say all that much about third-party software. It is kind of assuming that either all of the software is being developed by the item provider, the device that actually has the safety requirements. And it's up to that company and that development team to kind of figure out how to make third-party software work. However, the standard does provide a framework in which we can talk about third-party software. And the concept is called a safety element out of context or an SEOOC. Now, SEOOCs are pieces of something that might then become an item or a system in the car. But it's not the whole thing. It's one part of it. It's an element of that part that we can talk about outside of the safety requirements that it might be helping to fulfill. That's why it's called out of context. It's not in the context of any particular application. When you put it into the application, then it's in context and can be handled as part of the complete system. So the SEOOCs, they're required to be you know, developed to a very high quality standard, but you're not talking about anything else in particular. So at the end of the day, why does that matter? Well, SEOOCs are generally generic things that an automotive supplier might need to be able to build the products that they use that they don't build themselves. You know, it might be a microcontroller that comes from, you know, Renesas or from AMD or from any of the, of the microcontroller manufacturers. It might be a real-time operating system. In Europe especially, there is a, a standard called Autosar which basically defines the network topology of what happens inside of the car. So everything that goes over Ethernet or over CAN or over LIN or over whatever, you know, and then how application software interacts with specific services that it may require to operate correctly. So basically anything like that, that the developer says, hey, you know, I want to focus on making the greatest engine controller possible. I don't want to focus on how do I write an operating system. It allows them to go to an operating system provider and say, hey, you know, I need 
this operating system for this ECU, you provide that as an SEOOC, and then we can go ahead and use that as the building blocks for what we're building for what our system will actually do. So as we talk about SEOOCs, you know, as I said, they are basically components. And when we talk about software, you can use an SEOOC, but you still are required to show that it's appropriate to be used for safety. So you can't just go out on the internet and grab some random software and run it in your system, uh, even ignoring things like licensing and other issues that might come in. But you have to show conformance to the standard and you have to show that it's not going to introduce problems that are worse than the things that you wanted to solve. Now, 26.26.2 provides a few routes to do this. You can get software that's already been developed to the guidelines of 26.26.2, and we'll talk a lot about that in the coming slides. There is a whole section that describes qualifying a software component, but that has several requirements. You know, it has to come from somewhere. It has to have requirements that are, you know, consistently stated. You have to have testing that completely validates those requirements. And you have to show that using that component is equivalent. The way that it was developed is equivalent to 26.26.2. So it may have come from another safety standard, may have come from aerospace, or it may have come from industrial, or it may have come from a generic provider who is already providing software to those kinds of applications. And then there is a third way called proven in use, and that's usually used for something that's been used in a vehicle before or something that's been used in another industry and has already been shown to be safe in that sense. So you have to show something about the software that you're using to be able to use it as a generic component. The other alternative, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, is you can take it into your own system and basically show that it doesn't introduce any problems and that it's verified in a way that is appropriate for your application. But that requires a lot more work. Okay, so I'm curious, Rob, when you mentioned certified software component, what exactly does that mean? It's interesting. 26.26.2 doesn't really include a concept of certifying an SEOOC. It's a construct that the industry has created, and it dates back long before ISO 262662. It dates back to the original software safety standards like DO-178C, well, what was DO-178 in aerospace or, or IEC 61508, which is kind of a generic safety standard for any kind of electronic device. And the concept is that I'm a manufacturer and I want to use some third-party software. And at the end of the day, I want that third-party software to conform to my standard. And I can go to the vendor of that third-party software and I can say, hey, Mr. Vendor, give me all of your you know, requirement and design and testing information and developmental practice and your complete life cycle. And then I will review it and verify that it is conformant to the standard. And I can do that. There are actually large companies, not just in automotive, who essentially try to do that rather than anything else. You know, if I am a smaller company or even if I'm a big company, we've kind of come to an agreement that the software vendor already has to provide a lot of information to show this applicability to be used in a safety system. And so there is a collection of third party certifiers, you know, something like Toothsuit or Exida, or, or there are a lot of them, you know, Underwriters Laboratories and, and others who will basically go to the software provider and basically make sure that everything that they did was conformant to the standard, that, hey, the product actually meets its requirements, that the application can be used as an SEOOC, that any issue that's in the SEOOC either doesn't impact the system or is clearly enough documented so that the customer, the person who's making the ECU, can make their own decision. And then they go through and say, okay, this software meets those requirements and can be used safely as you would like to be able to use it. 
And so you get a certificate that says that the industry has basically decided that that review relieves the responsibility of the ECU provider to do that review themselves. It does impose additional requirements, but it makes it much easier to actually use the third-party software in your system. Okay, so Rob, these pre-certified software components will solve all of my ISO 262062 requirements, right? It doesn't, but, okay, when you start using a pre-certified component, you already know that a trusted third party reviewed it. And so you already are two steps ahead because the trusted third party has reviewed everything and has verified that the software can be used perhaps with some constraints. And it's the constraints that you need to still worry about when you apply it to a system. It is still your responsibility as the user to verify that you're using the component correctly and that it does not impact your safety function. But a certified component will come with something that we usually just call a safety manual. And that describes the assumptions of use, things you can and cannot do, any caveats on the use of software, any issues that you might need to be aware of, et cetera. A simple example, if I am writing my application in C and I go to a compiler vendor and I buy a C compiler and talking about tools is outside of the scope of this discussion, but there's a whole lot of requirements on the use of tools in the use of safety. But when I buy the compiler, I also buy a collection of C libraries, utility functions that I would like to use to be able to build my applications on. Those utility functions are software. And if it's certified, then it will come with its own safety manual describing what you can actually do with those libraries. Now, the standard C library contains hundreds and hundreds of functions, not all of which are appropriate for the use in safe systems. They're not deterministic because they have been around a long, long time. Their normal implementation might not be appropriate. Or it could be something like a, a strict or, or more standard dynamic memory allocator deallocator system, which over long periods of time leads to heap fragmentation and once again, loss of determinism. And so when I get that C library, I get the safety manual, which tells me essentially which of those functions I shouldn't use in my system. And then you go ahead and you don't do that. So basically, all of this guidance now is provided by the vendor rather than having to be discovered by the user. And then you as the user, as the person who is making the ECU, as part of your verification, will then show that you have followed those guidelines from the safety manual in your end device. And then all of that previous review then applies and you can deploy the system with that third-party software in your safe system as you expect. So there are requirements imposed, but they're not nearly as stringent as they would be if you just pulled software off the internet and used it. So what if I want to use non-certified software in my next automotive design? You can, and people do. You know, there are a lot of examples of using third-party or more normally open source software in systems that help to satisfy safety requirements. And the routes that I talked about before still apply, right? They require substantial effort on the part of the user. And there are now more and more examples of using open source software in certified systems. You start with Linux, right? Linux is the most robust, has the widest support, all of those nice things that you want of any operating system in the world. I mean, our tosses have their place. And they have actually very good places. But if I am building advanced ADAS systems, or if I'm moving towards autonomous drive or something like that, and RTOS is just not, for the most part, feature rich enough to handle, say, all of the AI and other capabilities that are required to make those things work. So basically, one of the things that the industry is trying to get their heads around is how to bring those two concepts together. And what they can do is they can look to other industries and how they solve those problems today. So if I have, say, Linux, and I want to do some kind of safety function, 
then I might have another system that's outside of Linux that essentially monitors it and basically says, hey, if there is a fault here, the outside monitor is the one that is responsible for recovery. You might use a hypervisor, you might use another system, you know, you might use another board. But more and more, the way this is managed is using what we call heterogeneous multiprocessor parts. And a heterogeneous multiprocessor part is basically one large microcontroller that might have some number of cores that are kind of very similar to the cores that run on your cell phone. They're pretty powerful. They do quite a bit. They multitask well, all of those kinds of things. But then they also have smaller, safer cores that can be used to kind of monitor the health of the system and basically force it to recover or go into some kind of safe state if something goes wrong. And then there are other options that are coming. The Linux Foundation is supporting a program called Alyssa that is basically trying to create a framework to allow at least a subset of Linux to be used in lower level safety applications as is. And they're making a lot of progress, and this is still a little while away, but, you know, we are heavily involved in that program. Other, you know, Linux providers are, are heavily involved in that program. And the intent is to basically show IEC 6.15.08 2 compliance for some subset of Linux, which roughly maps to ISO 26.26.2 ASIL B. ISO 26262 also tells us that if I've got a high-level safety requirement that might be ASIL D, but I can decompose that into multiple requirements, each of which is ASIL B, there's a simple math involved where B plus B equals D. And if I can do the B, then I'm good to go. And so that project will eventually make this whole process easier, but it's not there today. And so you basically have these other avenues that you need to go through. You can either show that the software itself is inherently safe through your own methods, you can have some kind of external observer to handle any potential faults in that software or something else. And we're going to focus a little bit on that external monitoring part, because that's where a lot of interesting things are happening today to support these heterogeneous multiprocessor systems. So, Rob, all of this ties back to trends within hardware, right? What are you seeing in terms of trends here? So basically, I was just talking about heterogeneous multiprocessors. And you can see a picture here that basically shows one example of a heterogeneous microprocessor that is targeting the automotive industry. And you can see that they're kind of complicated. But for the purposes of what we're talking about, it has all of the I.O. that we might need to develop an automotive system. It has a lot of internal safety capabilities that can be leveraged by the software to keep the system safe. And it also has the kinds of cores that I was talking about to run high-level applications and safety functions on the same single system. And there are a lot of these safety and security features that are built in, you know, that create islands where the I.O. that might be coming in doesn't affect critical timing of your safety system, but it also provides things like Bluetooth and Wi-Fi and whatever for external communications. And the challenge in using these kinds of systems is to basically make sure that the safety function gets priority, but allows the rest of the system to operate normally as long as something doesn't go wrong. And that's what we're really talking about here. That's where all of this is leading is that we have all of this guidance on software, but we know that a lot of the capabilities that we're looking for can't really be developed in that smaller scale system. I did a talk a while back about how, you know, the use of AI that's necessary for things like adaptive cruise control is difficult to map to ISO 262 because the requirements aren't really mapping to the implementation. The implementation is all about machine learning, right? It's like, hey, when you get these inputs, do this. When you get these inputs, do this. When you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then the system learns over time what the right thing to do is. But the right thing to do is to not hit the car in front of us. There's nothing in the software that says, hey, I'm going to prevent us from hitting the car in front of us. 
2626-2 is very much looking for that and will never find it. And so we need a different way of managing that that this kind of hardware provides. So, Rob, I know from previous Chalk Talks that heterogeneous multiprocessing can be really helpful in these types of systems, but there are some specific challenges using this kind of processing, right? Oh, yeah. There are a lot of challenges that need to be resolved when doing this. How do I separate those safety functions from the rest of the system, and how do I basically enable the safety function to manage the non-safety function in case something goes wrong? How do I share resources, right? To be able to do that management, the safety system needs to be able to communicate and share resources with the non-safe system. It needs to be able to look at its memory. It needs to be able to force a state transition if something has gone wrong. So how do you do that? And then how do you effectively utilize this system to satisfy the ever-demanding or ever-increasing demand for functionality that exists? I mean, automotive manufacturers aren't really known for using parts that are more expensive or more powerful than they feel that they absolutely need. In many cases, the opposite is true. They try to use the cheapest part possible and then wedge their functionality into it. You know, when you're making, you know, a million and a half vehicles and you can save 10 cents per processor, you know, that eventually turns into real money. And so they're constantly focused on cost versus capability versus the features that they present to their end user or that are necessary in their regulatory environment. And so these are all challenges that this kind of heterogeneous multiprocessing brings in, but it also provides them more flexibility. It provides them more overall power at a lower cost. In the past, there might have been two different systems, one that's running the advanced feature and then a separate system that's monitoring it. When I can bring that all into one system, I'm saving money on hardware, I'm saving space, and I'm helping reduce overall automobile complexity. Because as we all know, automobiles are now the most complicated thing that most of us own. And the automakers are really trying to decrease the amount of overall complexity under the hood by increasing the complexity of each of the pieces that are in it. And that's where a lot of this drive comes from, so to speak. So, Rob, what does Siemens offer in this space to help solve these issues? Basically, Siemens Embedded is a large supplier of both RTOSs, you know, the real-time operating system and all of the supporting software for that, and open source software across almost any industry that you can imagine. For the purposes of what we're talking about here, we're gonna talk a little bit about the RTOS. You know, Nucleus has been deployed over 3 billion times in safe systems across many, many industries. You know, it can support fairly inexpensive 32-bit microcontrollers, to these much more powerful 64-bit SOCs. It's integrated into IoT, which is something that the automotive manufacturers are trying to emulate from the Internet of Things. And I've even heard it called the automotive Internet of Things as an example, you know, because those cars need to be more and more connected to the outside world for updates and for communication. And then ultimately for autonomous drive, where we will want the cars to be talking to each other to make sure that when one car makes one decision, that it's not incompatible with the decision that another car is making. So all of these things are happening, and Nucleus is there to help. And we have a non-certified version of Nucleus that is more feature-rich and capable than our certified version of Nucleus, which is certified to ISO 262 d So it can be used for any automotive safety application. And it's just a question of what makes the most sense for the system that you're providing. If it makes sense to use Linux, we have Linux that can help. If it makes sense to use an RTOS, we have an RTOS that can help. And then we back it with all of the things that you would expect. Middleware, power management, SMP, it's a royalty-free system. It's, it's a good cost versus performance solution for if you've decided that you need an RTOS and if you've decided that you need a kind of more feature-rich set of capabilities like Linux, then we provide kind of the most robust Linux distribution in the world in that we provide it all. And we can provide support for 
essentially any application that you're working on. And so we have this complete gamut of capabilities that allows you as the customer to design and develop the system of your choice. And then on top of these operating systems, the solutions that we have, we have something that we call the multi-core framework, which is also certified to these demanding standards or, or will be. And basically the multi-core framework is our solution for the issues of the heterogeneous multi-core processor that we talked about a few minutes ago, where we have something that can communicate between the safe and the not so safe world that leverages the hardware capabilities of the system that it runs. So for example, the hardware isolation capabilities that are on all of these modern heterogeneous microprocessors, our multi-core framework leverages those to the greatest extent possible to maintain the separation between the two and only allow interactions between the two in ways that you have designed and fully understand. You know, it basically gets the native execution and performance that running on those lower powered safety cores. So it's not a Java based solution and it's not anything else. It's running directly on the hardware. And it also enables multiple operating systems, which is important because at the end of the day, especially with a lot of these advanced features that we're talking about, you want to basically do as much of that as possible under Linux. And then you want something else to make sure that when something goes wrong, that it's managed. And so our multi-core framework solution basically addresses those concerns. Excellent. Well, Rob, this has been quite a lot to take in today. Can you recap your main points for me? Sure. So basically, in the world of automotive functional safety, ISO 262662 is our guidebook that tells us what we need to be thinking about when we're creating safe systems that we all need, you know, because we all drive automobiles, at least for the most part, and we all want them to not break down and cause safety issues in unexpected ways. And they tell us a lot about how the software that's running in those, you know, modern automobiles needs to be managed all the way from the way that its requirements are specified to the way that it's validated and even before and after those things. Now, where do those requirements come from? And then how do I maintain and extend the life of those features even after the automobile is deployed? All of those things are already considered in this guidebook that we all now follow in the automotive world. And they give us a number of ways to use third-party software, such as that supplied by Siemens Embedded, but there are a number of vendors who provide software for the automotive world. But it gives us a common way of looking at the world and making sure that all of the industry's offerings can be used by the tier one or tier two suppliers to the OEMs to help the OEM make a system that will ultimately be as safe as possible, that will not fail in an unexpected way, and will let the driver take over control as much as possible, or as we move into the future, to let the car take over control as much as possible. And all of that is enabled by 2626.2, the rules that it gives us, and then the software that many, many people provide to make those things reality. Excellent. Well, Rob, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Well, thank you, Amelia. We will continue to move forward on this, and I hope to talk to you again soon. And before we go, you didn't forget to click that link, did you? There you can find even more information about this topic from Siemens. For Chalk Talks, I'm Amelia Dalton from eejournal.com. For more Chalk Talks, head on over to the Chalk Talks section of EE Journal. You can't miss it. It's right across the top. Or head on over to YouTube, youtube.com slash eejournal. 